Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenny Huang. I'm your moderator for the specific section, IPv6 deployment section. And we have four presentations in this section. Uh, so actually, we have 90 minutes, so we have plenty of time. So every speaker, you can try to utilize your time and try to respond to the question and answer to the audience. So the first speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Jeff Hewson, as you know Jeff Hewson pretty well, the chief scientist of APNIC. He's going to introduce IPv's performance measurement. Uh, let's welcome Jeff Hewson. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kenny. <laughs> this is the Jeff, yes. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, wow, all well, this... That turned out the wrong way, so let me explain just a tiny bit. We measure performance in V6. The way we do this is actually through, I don't think there's no previous slide, is it? Is actually through Google Ads. Who hasn't seen an ad? Who hasn't seen an ad on their phone, on their laptop? You know, where you go, there's an ad. Double click is amazing. Now, the thing about most ads is it's not just a picture. There's a huge amount of scripting that you can actually jam into an ad. And as long as you're not naughty, Google don't like viruses and bad stuff, as long as you're not naughty, you can actually do an awful lot. And so what the ad does is actually get the user, the browser, if you will, or your mobile phone, to actually do what you always do, retrieve URLs. Okay, so it just gets a couple of URLs. These are just one by one GIFs. Me? Now, what I don't want is caches, proxies, and intermediaries. My servers want to see you. And so the way we do this is we actually use a unique DNS name. So every time you get an ad, the names that are generated are specific to you and that ad. Right? Someone else will get a different collection of names. Okay, so that eliminates caching. Never seen it before, can't cache it, nothing works. So the next trick is you are talking to me. And so if I give you a URL that only has a quad A record, I'm sorry to use your convenient target here. If it only has a quad A record, I can only do V6. If it only has an A record, you can only do V4. So I can actually set up two sessions between these two endpoints, you and my server, at the same time, or very close to time, running V4 and V6. And I can compare them, because through the cloud, there's actually these two sessions, V4 and V6. So that's simple. How many ads do we run? Um, that scale on the left is in millions. Um, on the left over here, um, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. There was a bad day when Google just went mad and, and our systems melted. Um, the current system is, is running at, you know, around, around um, gee, I need my glasses, uh, around um, 8 million samples a day. 8 million independent measurement points all over the internet. Um, Google Ads, by the way, is random. The bastards keep on changing everything. And you know, some days, all of a sudden, they up the ad, up the ad volume. I haven't upped my money. Uh, and other times, the ad volume goes down. Whatever magic is behind Google Ads, they make $300 billion a year, and they must know what we're doing. Uh, that's fine. But I just tag on the back and just deliver, around at the moment, 8 million ads a day. Um, I run four servers. One in Latin America, one in Dallas, one in Frankfurt, one in Singapore. Those servers are actually not single servers, it's actually a group of machines, but let's think of them as a server. Full packet capture all the time, every packet. So I don't even need logs, I'm capturing every single packet. And so one way of actually understanding the first part of this is to actually look at the initial setup of a V6 session. I've done the DNS, I found this quad A record, and now it's a case of going, right, let's do the, HTT let's do the HTTPS dance, which means got to start up TCP, got to start up TLS, and then do HTTP. 
got to start up TCP, no matter what. So interestingly, there's the TCP three-way handshake. Client getting the ad sends a SYN, I send back a SYN ACK, you send me an ACK. It's great. But interestingly, sometimes, and V6 is certainly far more prevalent than V4, that ACK, the SYN ACK that I send, goes missing. And if that goes missing, nothing else happens. TCP just doesn't work. Let's call that a failure. So that's a connection failure. Um, why measure that? Well, oddly enough, looking at this kind of connection is actually the start of most of the architecture of dual stack. In other words, when I've got a machine that's got V4 and V6, part of the way that it figures out which protocol to use is actually it starts to try and complete a TCP handshake. The first protocol to complete, with a little bit of handicapping, wins that protocol. So the performance of this handshake is really important. And if it fails, even if you have V6, you sent me a SYN, but if you're not getting my SYN ACK, you might as well not have V6. It's not working. Um, now let's put this into context. This is the failure rate for the world since, gee, 2016. And currently, around the world, around one in 50 sessions in V6 don't work, and it's getting worse over time, not better. These folk have six. They sent me a V6 SYN, but somehow I can't seem to get back to them with my SYNAC. Now, I know I can reach them because I gave them an ad. We're talking in four. For all these folk, it's 100% for, because that's how you're actually running this stuff. So this is, if you will, the relative failure against four is currently sitting around one in 50 and getting worse. Interesting. Um, why? Well, sometimes your local config gets it wrong. The address of the source of that SYN packet is unreachable. When I send a packet back to that address, it goes off into nowhere land. That happens. Much more frequently, you have some wonderful firewall system that thinks all V6 packets are insecure. It happens. So my SYNAC is kind of one of those. It's a V6 packet out of here. Uh, or random stuff. Nee, don't know what's going on. Um, but there's something else going on, too, inside these reasons. And one of the ones I've been looking at lately in preparing this slide packet is actually looking at this little bunch of data right at the end, where the world got worse. That's not right. That's not right. Why did it get worse? So let's blow it up, look at it in more detail. And oddly enough, it's in North America. Now, there are a couple of really big V6 providers in North America. T-Mobile, Comcast, Verizon and AT&T have all done V6. There's a huge amount of V6 there. Why, around Christmas, did the failure rate just go rocketing up? Them or me? Probably me. Let's look at one day. So now I divide all these handshakes up into one-second buckets. Wow! Just around three intervals in that one day I picked, there are spikes. For that short amount of time, the routes that my service provider in Dallas is using to get to folk just disappeared. And while I was able to get traffic, routing's asymmetric, don't forget, I couldn't deliver. So those spikes are actually spikes in V6 routing. So you complain to the service provider, your V6 routing doesn't work. Hmm, you're the first person to mention that. Why am I the first person to mention that? Happy eyeballs. Don't forget, for everyone else, if V6 doesn't work, you just use V4, the help desk doesn't receive a complaint, everything's wonderful, happy eyeballs. So happy eyeballs is good and bad. It actually hides these quite significant routing problems 
and nobody notices and nobody cares. Have they fixed the problem? No, it's as bad as ever. So around three times a day, I get this routing thing and I'm unable to convince anyone it's a problem and unable to get anyone to fix it. Really frustrating. Your network could have the same problem and you wouldn't notice it because V4 fixes up every sin, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, so where it became obvious was actually in a network that's V6 native, V4 overlay. Should be perfect except over January. T-Mobile is a V6 network with V4 overlay. But no, not working properly. So that sort of leads me to, they're doing a really good job, but somehow inside the V6 routing system, particularly in North America, things aren't going right. Um, here's a different picture because it's not global. Um, one of the other ones that does 464X lab is our friends in India, Reliance Geo. Exactly the same thing. A V6 substrate, that's the country level of failure, but Geo is brilliant. Oddly enough, again, a slight rise. I suspect it's routing once more. But in this case, it's got better. Yay. But if it's going wrong, none of you will notice it because none of you are looking. Um, those two networks are 464X LATs. They're native V6. They'll always work. Uh, here's one that's actually been bad for some time in Vietnam. Um, the failure rate is kicking around um, 30 to 40 percent. And that's kind of tough. I might, you really wonder, they'd actually be better turning it off at this point and understanding what's going on. Um, and I've actually looked at a number of countries and some of them aren't doing so well. Interestingly, Chile has got worse more recently, uh, Costa Rica, Morocco, etc. You can look at this online too. But it is kind of interesting that there are some significant failure rates of over 10 percent in this area. And the true fault diagnosis is certainly challenging to do, very challenging. The bigger picture, there are certain areas, um, God, Morocco, that's right, uh, testing my geography here, aren't you? Chile, uh, Iraq, and so on, where it's slightly redder than most, and that's actually indicating some degree of connection failure. Now, even though V6 is broken, it doesn't matter because Happy Eyeballs fixes absolutely everything. And so in this sort of transitioning dual stack work, meh, not a problem. Users don't even see it. Um, as long as we keep on running V4, if you're prepared to do V4 forever, pff, why am I talking? Uh, if you think there's an end to this V4 madness, well, you know, there's another problem. Um, and there are places which are actually doing a much, much better job. And I suspect there's a little bit more care and attention in the routing space. Uh, so India, Iceland, Australia and Korea, their connection rates are actually really close to experimental noise. And so it is possible to do a really good job, uh, but it's also possible to do a less than good job. Why? Stateful transition technologies are crap. Really not a good idea. Um, anything that orchestrates the DNS, the network state together, like DNS 6.4, I would actually label as the bad idea fairy from hell back again. <laughs> do not do this, it's crap. Um, lies in the DNS are always bad, even if for the best of motives. So, you know, that kind of work, don't go there, it's just nonsense. Uh, and the other thing to really bear in mind here is, at the moment, the problem's being fixed by dual stack, but dual stack isn't the goal. The goal is V6. And so in some ways, you really need to be serious about looking for, identifying, and fixing these six problems. So there are some issues around that, and we actually noticed that in both New Zealand and India at some point. Um, the timers are all important. And there is a tolerance of 50 milliseconds between V6 and V4 for all this to work, which means you've got to route the same path for V6 and V4 as much as possible. Because when you don't, all of a sudden, things look really, really lousy. India was trying to get to Singapore, where my server is. For V4, it went across uh, the Bay of Bengal really fast. For V6, for a while, it went to England because, you know, 
It's a really long way from India to England and back to Singapore, as some of you who have flown that might figure it out. And the amount was certainly a lot longer, even for a packet, than 50 milliseconds. Timers went bung, V6 died out, everyone used V4. So get the routing right. Same with Vodafone in New Zealand. Use the system where the DNS gave V4 answers much faster than V6. Uh, you've really got to be careful about both the DNS and routing. So as I said there, sometimes it's the DNS. Um, three suggestions. Don't use stateful transition. It's a terribly bad idea and things just blow up in your face. Um, don't encapsulate V6 and V4. It's a really, really, really bad idea. Tunnels are bad, right? Just tunnels are bad. MTU problems, etc. And last but not least, keep your routing together. If someone is your upstream in four, they should be your upstream in six. Keep them aligned. Stop doing V6 overlays or V6 silliness. Uh, it can be challenging for the multi-homed, but for Christ's sake, if you keep them aligned, things will work better than not. Um, yeah, the text on this got much bigger than, than my original slide. Sorry about that. Let's talk a little bit about timing. I measure the time between the sin and the ack. And if you think about it, that's the round trip time. The time it takes for me to send you back a SYNAC and then you send me an ACK is one round trip time. And I've got a measurement in four and a measurement in six. I can compare them. Why do the handshake? Interestingly, it's because the handshake occurs in TCP in the kernel. There's no user scheduling. Hang on a second, this really interesting web page has appeared, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is a kernel level connect and it's actually a lot tighter in terms of timing than an application level ACK. So this is why I'm actually looking at the TCP handshake as the RTT indicator. It, it's certainly slightly more reliable. Um, this is the zero line. If the world had the same RTT, the data point would be there. This is V6 is slower, this is V6 is faster. The world average right now, and there's a lot of reasons why the sort of variance and all this, but the average difference is about 18 milliseconds or so. It's been worse. It's been better. Sometimes it's been a lot worse. 18 milliseconds, well, we were doing better at the end of last year, and it's got a bit worse, but, you know, it's still not that bad. US, it's faster. Now, I suspect that there's a number of things going on. With 464x lat, 6 is faster than 4. This is less to do. And it is a marginal thing, but it is around 12 milliseconds or so. I'm in Dallas. I should get really good V4 and V6 connectivity. V6 is faster. Well, woohoo, but I'm still not quite sure why. Maybe Lee Howard has some ideas about firewalls and state transitions, etc. But, you know, V6 is faster. That's not always the case. Here's China. Uh, yes, that's a really, really big number. That is indeed around 80 milliseconds slower. How far can you go in 80 milliseconds? To Perth and back twice from here, or across the Pacific from China, which is what's going on. So in China's case, what we're seeing is the stuff in V6 to get to Singapore tends to do an east-west flip across the Pacific, whereas the V4 stuff tends to use cable paths that go north-south. And that's always been the case. That's why the variance has been always around that 50, 60 millisecond because of the difference between across the Pacific and north-south, basic geography. How could they fix it? Make their routing congruent, as I said before. Australia. Um, V4 is actually faster than V6 to get to Singapore ever so slightly. Around uh, 7 to 10 milliseconds. Transition technology, slight variation in cable paths. Hmm. I don't know how Telstra gets up to Singapore, because that's the major contributor in the V6 uh, numbers at this point. Um, there is CME V3 that goes up the west coast, but there's also the cable systems that go up to Guam and across. But it seems that there's a subtle amount of variance there that makes V4 slightly faster to Singapore than not. Now, weaknesses in this. The major weakness is that there are millions and millions of endpoints on one side, the A end, you the client, and four measurement points at my end. 
So this is hardly a massive n squared measurement. I, I only have so much budget from AP, Nick, thank you very much, but I can only afford to run four of these things. They are expensive when, when you sort of set this up. So yes, it is a localised experiment and I'm only using four endpoints. But if your routing was aligned, the difference would be zero, or close to it. So deviation from zero is actually asymmetric routing. And oddly enough, whether V4 and V6 are slower and faster is less important then the issue is they're different. And because they're different, if the difference gets higher than 50 milliseconds, happy eyeballs comes into play. And you might have done all this V6 work, but everyone's still preferring four because happy eyeballs. And so in some ways, you're quite okay to sort of get them out of whack a bit, but if that out of whackedness starts to trip application timers for happy eyeballs, you'll end up paying the price because applications won't prefer six anymore. Um, I've got a couple of seconds. I'll use it very quickly. That's not all. This is old measurement. We're doing another measurement right now to make sure it's still there. But V6 uses the new exposed to extension headers, particularly fragmentation. You put it between IP and, and the protocol, TCP, UDP. It inserts a shim. If you're a piece of hardware that likes to know port numbers, you've got to do more than one lookup. In fact, you've got to unravel the chain of headers, or you can just drop the packet. Cheap silicon drops the packet. We tested 10 million times in the DNS. <laughs> um, we had 4 million failures on a large packet that had fragmentation, 38%. You can't use fragmented V6 in the DNS and expect it to work, it won't. And that's not getting any better. But that's the DNS. Who cares about the DNS? Well, this is HTTPS. This is the SYNAC handshake. And what I'm doing now in HTTPS is fragmenting the TCP packet. Yeah, I know it's bad, but what the hell. And I get a 22% failure rate across this experiment. That's, again, really, really bad. V6 doesn't handle extension headers in our network today. It does not do that. You can't fragment. And that's actually interesting. Why? I don't know. Um, local security policies at the client edge of the network? Maybe. If that's the case, it'll fix itself over time. But maybe it's something more fundamental. This whole issue with path MTU management and V6 extension headers is actually in silicon. And although you say, oh, well, it's only a third of the internet, 27%, doesn't matter, the install base is unimportant. No one's going to clean this mess up. Nobody. You can't use V6 extension headers. You can't fragment. Or if you feel like, you know, charging at windmills, go figure. I don't fancy your chances. This is really hard. And the other part of this is all you network operators out there probably have equipment Need I mention the word cat switches and there's Juniper equivalents and Huawei's and so on, you don't even know it's happening. You're not looking. And if you're not looking, you're never even going to fix it. So as far as I can see, you've got to live with it. The answer is, therefore, you can't fragment in V6. Well, I was meant to scribble out the long one. We're not going to clean up the switching infrastructure. We're just going to have to live with that brokenness. So that means when you run V6, don't run a 1500 MTU. Ratchet it down a little to make sure that the packets you send out don't hit areas, capsulation, whatever, inside the network that cause problems with path MTU. Start low, it'll work. Stress it out at the edge, nah, never going to work well. And that's all I've got. Um, any questions on that? Thank you. Hey. Hi, Lee Howard, IPv4 Global, Telco Stream Bank. Uh, so to be precise on extension headers, uh, you, they, they don't work on the general purpose internet. Using them inside your data center, perfectly fine, right? Because you, you control the network? You know, in a, uh, in a, if you have control of the ASIC, blah, 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 and you bought the right gear, it will work. Well, so the internet has no <laughs> such control. Right, that, that, sorry, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. We know people who use extension headers on all kinds of networks just 
not the general purpose internet is kind of where we're going. Do you want to, do you want to jump in, Warren? This is, <clears throat> we can have an IETF boff right here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you triggered one of my. So yes, they probably work well inside your data center as long as you can make sure that they always stay within your data center. Right. As yeah, soon yeah. as you leak them out, and they leak out all the time, yep. you're screwed. Okay. I see an awful lot Fair. of net 10 leaking out of an awful lot of data centers. Sure. The RFC says don't do that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was curious about your, the, the, the failure rate that's been getting worse. Um, you said uh, a couple, couple of questions that I had. One was um, because of the potential for a race condition where <clears throat> where the V4 response comes back before the V6 SYNAC has been completed. Um, have you looked, to, looked at that over time to see when Happy Eyeballs has been deployed in various OSs and, which, and when we switch to Happy Eyeballs version 2 to see if there's a correlation between Happy Eyeballs timer changes and, and, and your uh, failure rates? Um, uh, it's tricky. Um, if I had a way of encoding the end user identity, the operating system they're using, and the browser they're using inside the 64 bits of the interface identifier code of the V6 address, I'd be there. But the problem is I'm, I'm sort of looking at the Synax. Yeah, no. I, I, and it, no, it's kind of hard. I, and because I'm doing a packet capture, all the data is encrypted in TLS. And right. so to actually do that work. <laughs> No, that, that, I, I was more meaning if we knew, like, the, on, on Patch Tuesday, on such and such date, that was the date that, that a version... I actually don't know when, when those patches yeah. happened, so... Yeah, that, no, that, that would yeah. be harder to go back and find. Um, you talked about, you think that on some of those spikes were, uh, were routes flapping... And just, <clears throat> I, look, this is, I, I was doing this last week right. in a mad hurry, sorry, and, and I was kind of going, this is wrong. And the first right. idea is 7% failure is such an odd number. <laughs> Right? It's kind of not everyone, it's just some. And so I thought the first thing to do was divide it by time mm -hmm. to see if this was spikes. And yeah. we, oh, lo and behold, it's time. No, I'm glad you did that, yeah. And, and because it's time-based, I'm leaping to routing. Right. And just call it intuition, mm -hmm. but it seems to me to be the most obvious reason why there's an issue. Well, is that something that you think you'd be able to see in, in route views or there is? Don't forget, it's me reaching them, not them reaching me. This makes it all the more challenging. I am not sure I will see this in RIS or route views because, right, right. those are vantage points over there. Right, you, you might not, but yeah, because you don't exactly. know where, you, know, wh but you I, don't know I, who lost what route. I need, exactly. a more, I need a more solid time signature first. Yeah, okay, yeah, fair. Uh, did I have one more? Oh, so on uh, NAT64, I, I did a blog post, um, Aaron shared it uh, six months, four months ago, something like that, about why I thought IPv6 was faster, um, the, the reasons for the measurements we were seeing. Um, one of the things that I looked at was comparing the various, especially mobile providers, and comparing ones who were doing, you know, and trying to compare NAT64, and it seems to me that it's not the NAT64 translator that's doing the slowness. It's the, it's the CLAT, it's the NAT46 inside the handset that's the slowness. And I've talked to one handset uh, operating system vendor who said, oh yeah, of course. Um, so I think it's the translator in the handset is doing it in software, not the big translator, the, 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 the CGN in the sky. I have this super duper A11 ultra fast gigahertz chipset, and you reckon it's taking 10 milliseconds to do a CLAT translation. Whoever these folk got as coders, fire them and get someone professional. It does seem an amazing thing. I'll take your word for it. Apple or Android? Um, this one's an Apple, but I'm, my... But my issue about software quality on CLAT and that commentary is it shouldn't take that long, no matter what. There's a, yeah, there's a, yeah, lot, of exactly. there's so a lot of should in the world, isn't there? Uh, there, there is a lot of bad code. The, exactly. The problem is that in Apple, you don't have that problem, because Apple only uses the CLAT if you are doing tethering. Okay? But in Android, the problem is that even they could do a stateless not for six, they are not doing that. Lorenzo, take note. Uh, we, we have told him. <laughs> we have told him. Well, I'm telling him again. Lorenzo, if you're listening, it's your problem. No other questions? Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Jeff. Before you leave. Oh, okay. thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff Houston, uh, because the I didn't expect we have such a higher failure rate in IPv6, 
And, and oh, thank you for happy eyeball. Let's confuse us. We almost lost in the V4, V6 traffic. So the next speaker is going to introduce IPv6 traffic uh, by David Uke from Telstra. Let's welcome. Thank you, David Woodgate, Telstra, or maybe for Jeff's benefit, is that Don Quixote? Um, let me work, just work out how this works. Excellent. So Telstra's been working on deploying uh, IPv6 in its network now for, uh, two, uh, for 12 years. Um, we started the program in 2008. The fussy people um, who just spoke, uh, spoke before uh, would probably say, but we were doing things in Canberra uh, about 2000, 2002, but that was, uh, um, that was uh, very much in a trial thing. In 2008, we decided to get serious and actually try to uh, put it natively in the network and see what, uh, uh, you know, ma actually make it a, a standard part of our operations. And we've been, you know, ever since then, we've been progressively adding it on. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is how we've got to where we are, and also what the, um, uh, now that we've got a large IPv6 user base, uh, what, IP, uh, what are we seeing in terms of traffic? So we definitely took a, a, a heading from the core outwards sort of perspective. We enabled um, AS1221 um, as a dual stack backbone back in 2011. Um, AS4637 was also uh, enabled at that time, of course, so that we could actually talk to the internet, uh, to the IPv6 internet such as it was at the time. Um, and we also allowed enterprise and wholesale customers to opt into IPv6 on their connections uh, around that time. So far, so good. Then in 2012, we did our first um, ADSL, um, um, our business internet at that, uh, business internet connections at that stage um, also had IPv6 added. That was a, really an extension of the enterprise and wholesale uh, product. Um, that, uh, that was pretty straightforward. I haven't mentioned it here, but we also put uh, enabled IPv6 on our VPN products as well. Now, where it uh, obviously got serious in terms of numbers, we started turning it on for consumers in uh, 2014, specifically for NBN um, and some ADSL uh, along the way. Um, and the, obviously, as NBN has expanded in this co uh, country, um, the numbers for um, fixed broadband, uh, for V6 fixed broadband, have also gone up during that time. Of course, that only gets us to access. In terms of actually presenting an IPv6 face to the rest of the world, it took us longer. It took us till um, uh, 2015 to get to the web portal. Uh, uh, actually activated and uh, uh, um, uh, with an IPv6 quad A record, um, but that's uh, been working. And then the one that took the hardest amount of work, uh, for which I'm very grateful that of uh, uh, the dedication of the and enthusiasm of the IPv6, uh, uh, IPv6 mobile team, um, because it took a, lo a long, long path to get there. Um, we had our first uh, IPv6 uh, dual stack enabled uh, device at the end of 2016. Um, we greatly expanded that in 2019. Um, and some of you who read Osnog uh, may realise that um, that's all been dual stack up till now. Um, we've been um, we've now actually got to the stage where we're, we're starting to. Um, try some um, single stack IPv6 as well uh, with, with some devices. It's, a, it's still being introduced. It's a, a, a long way to um, a long way till we've got full penetration yet. The other aspect of, of with IPv6 uh, with our fixed fixed broadband is that um, we're using uh, IPv6 um, um, also on the. Um, some people may know that we've, uh, when we do um, broadband services we, uh, these days, we also have, uh, provide a mobile backup, and we're doing 
um, single stack um, uh, single stack backup on those um, uh, mobile backups uh, uh, for fixed broadband. So, the obvious question is, why did it take 12 years to do this? You know, there's a lot of reasons. And, you know, uh, first of all, 2008, IPv6 was, what, about 12 years old as a protocol, still relatively young at that stage, uh, 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 relatively young at that stage, and certainly, um, I th uh, given the, all the discussions around here, you'll appreciate that um, it was very, uh, very much an early learning stage for uh, the company. And of course, we had to be cautious. You know, it's, it's all very well to say uh, we're preparing ourselves for the future, we're preparing ourselves for the exhaustion of IPv4, um, but if we um, destroyed uh, the, uh, the services and all our customers, um, no one would uh, thank us for it. So we had, to, uh, we had to be really careful about adding this new protocol, which um, nobody knew about. Which was just as well, because frankly, industry maturity with IPv6, um, uh, th you know, in the early part of this decade, or of the pre maybe the previous decade now, depending on how you're counting, um, was pre uh, pretty low. I can't think of a single rollout of IPv6 that we didn't have to roll back uh, somewhere along the line uh, to, um, uh, to have uh, fix something uh, in, um, in uh, what had been done. Now, sometimes it might have been, uh, sometimes it might have been our own configuration in a subtle way, but a lot of times there was just some very, very subtle and highly technical issue that didn't become apparent until it was actually in production, and, uh, and in production for uh, quite a while. Um, so that's why the caution was important. We, uh, we did leave things in, uh, um, in first releases for quite a while to see if we could pick things up, and frequently we did. Um, I can't, uh, unfortunately, the length of time now means that I'm uh, struggling to remember all the details of these things, but be assured that um, you know odd things like um, Ethernet packet uh, buffers and um, uh, 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 all, so, uh, all sorts of odd things came up. There was also the question of priorities um, in the scheme of a company, uh, you know, uh, and a major telco trying to sustain uh, or you know sustaining its. Um, products, uh, keeping uh, uh, its uh, new products coming out to market and everything else. Rolling out IPv6 you know, doesn't directly earn revenue. Um, naturally, it has, to, uh, it has to be scheduled into everything else that's happening. Um, uh, so uh, I'm pleased that the company t uh, took as much time and effort as it did to do what it, is, it did, but it couldn't always put it as at the top of the priority stack. One of the interesting things, though, was trying to establish the IPv6 mindset. And I think, you know, listening to the past couple of days of discussions, I think we're still struggling as an industry with this. Um, I think we're still, you know, there, uh, there's an element of, is, isn't IPv6 just experimental? Isn't, um, you know, oh, why would you want to add IPv6 to, uh, to that? I think we've got past that particular stage, but I think we haven't qu quite got to the stage where, uh, yet, where people are saying, "No, IPv6, uh, you know, IPv6 absolutely has to be the first priority," uh, and we're certainly a long way from that point. But even IPv6 absolutely must be there uh, um, at uh, first release. I think. You know, we're a lot further along that path. I think most uh, engineers uh, I've talked to these days do actually recognise uh, the importance of having IPv6 out there. But, you know, I th even now um, I see th things, that, uh, you know, in the heat of trying to meet deadlines and everything else, there's still a, uh, at times a struggle to say, hey, don't forget the IPv6 in the, uh, in the process. And then, of course, there's monitoring. Um, we just need to sit back for a while and check that everything is indeed working as we expect. Um, 
and uh, going along with the idea of industry maturity, there's a, a, trying to see what is actually happening in, uh, and measure IPv6 protocols um, uh, from the network and from devices hasn't always been easy. Um, for those of us who have been around for a few decades in the industry, um, you, uh, you, some of you might remember that um, measuring IPv4 protocols in the 90s um, uh, versus just measuring packets out of interfaces had its challenges at times. Um, I'm still sensing that for some of our, uh, uh, when it comes to tooling and uh, uh, being able to detect and report on IPv6 um, clearly and properly, that's still a bit of a challenge. But nevertheless, we got there. Um, and you know, the fact is we've got, um, uh, we've got uh, a broad, uh, uh, a very broad consumer ba uh, base, especially in fixed, uh, we've got a good, broad, uh, a good proportion of our whole, uh, sorry, of our mobile um, groups now using V6 as well. So, what does this mean in terms of the IPv6 traffic that we're seeing? You'd think that with all that, uh, all those customers out there, we'd see a lot of IPv6 traffic. Um, so, you know, we're now. Uh, we're now safely above 70% uh, fixed broadband. And that's, uh, that's our total broadband of both NBN and ADSL. If you just looked at NBN, it's, it would be a lot higher. Um, mobile, I think when we're talking about consumer mobile, um, we're, uh, we're around 30% mark at the moment and, and growing day by day at, the, at this stage. Um, but the IPv6 traffic we're seeing is very much depending on the, the traffic type. Now, this is the point, I'll go back to my comment about the data and the measurements. I'm not sure how much confidence I have in the, uh, in the data and the measurements, and I'm uh, more than happy to hear or, you know, other perspectives on um, what's, uh, what people are seeing in the network, uh, you know, out in the wild and out in the, in the, uh, in the internet. Um, but if you have, uh, have better data, I would certainly like to see it, and I'd just like to uh, show it up here. So, and what we've seen is that IPv6 usage is depending on traffic type. And now, uh, I'll uh, go into speculation mode on the next slide, but we're, um, when it comes to some social media traffic, we've seen up to about 60% of um, social, uh, social media traffic um, using IPv6. But when it comes to video, um, I've seen uh, figures for large, uh, large video uh, uh, providers um, drop to below 15% in IPv6. Um, and when it comes to international internet coming to, uh, uh, um, from outside of AS1221 to, uh, in, into Australia, I'm only seeing about 4% on average. Um, and you know, obviously the question is, why have we got this variation? Why up to 60% for some and why down to, uh, you know, 4% for, for international? Now, as I said, I'll speculate for a moment. Um, on the ba uh, basis of what we've heard, also heard over the past um, 24 hours, we heard that um, IX's 27% connectivity, I think, uh, um, you know, or peering connectivity with IPv6. Um, Jeff was making the good point about happy eyeballs, and that might come into the international thing, potentially. But, you know, I suspect that the reason that social media is so high is that social media is mainly done on devices which... Um, ha are sophisticated, have well-developed um, operating systems, um, you know, uh, and uh, which will prefer um, IPv6 where, uh, where at all possible because of happy eyeballs. Um, video. Now, video is an interesting one. Why, why would it get down to the, uh, so low? And, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are some examples where it's a bit higher than 15%. I've uh, had all sorts of measurements along the way, but uh, some were very strong uh, at being quite low. 
My suspicion is that that's because of um, TVs and other home devices um, still not using IPv6, that there's not a lot of IPv6 uh, take up in the home. Um, that's speculation. I'm not, uh, I haven't done personal measurements uh, around multiple homes and, uh, uh, or anything like that. Um, again, anybody with evidence on these things, I'd pretty, uh, like to see. And as for inter international internet, I have a theory. Uh, um, you might, uh, some of Jeff's um, data on happy eyeballs might, uh, might answer one thing, that, that if there was a delay on the IP, uh, IPv6 versus IPv4, uh, might be enough to trigger happy eyeballs to prefer IPv4. But another possibility is that I suspect the Alexa top 10 are very good at uh, IPv6 and are very good at local connections within a, uh, within a country and, an, uh, and connections to ASs. Um, and so you don't uh, tend not to use international for, the, uh, for that Alexa top 10. Whereas for... Um, as you get into the long tail, all the uh, vast number of websites, mail servers, into, you know, the things that are distributed across the, uh, the world um, that don't use local caches, don't have local, um, uh, local peering, I suspect a lot of those may be you know, historic or else just simply um, you know, part of that 73% uh, of ISPs not connected, uh, not connected with IPv6, and so you, I suspect it's uh, that's what the reason for the four percent on international. Um, happy to uh, at the end of the presentation hear some debate on that particular point. So I'm, uh, I, this started me wondering: what does this all show about IPv6 maturity? Um, you know, started off with IPv4 only. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've uh, developed a, I, I put a maturity model here f uh, for the fun of it, um, not with the expectation of anybody else using it, just uh, uh, to uh, suggest a few things. Um, if we say that customer is able to use dual stack, um, is, the, uh, is the first level up to, you know, to enable um, the first use of IPv6? I think a lot of, you know, that's where a lot of us got to. And then a next level up is where uh, customers can use IPv6 using NAT64. Uh, uh, sorry, I use IPv6 single stack. And dare I say, uh, given the previous comments, using NAT64 uh, uh, when required um, for the uh, v6 to v, uh, v4 translation. Um, and as, the main thing about that is it, it stops users, uh, stop needing to use IPv4 for internet, uh, basic internet access. But then we get into the things that, we start getting into areas where the ISPs can't, uh, can't do anything else about, um, or you know, have more limited in, uh, uh, impact. Um, when you start saying about all IP, uh, public internet services supporting IPv6, um, if, as dual stack, um, that's ha that has to be something that you know all the uh, hosting providers, the publishers, uh, um, uh, content publishers, everybody uh, needs to help uh, uh, move along in order to um, make sure that V6 is being used at every level of uh, um, of the internet where possible. You know, so all those, again, all those mail servers, all those NTP servers, all those uh, long, long tail of websites in various um, nooks and crannies around the world, um, um, anything that could be done to help move them to V6 um, it, it will obviously help transition. Likewise, and this, you know, where I've, I've got three and four are separate, but you know they're pretty much in parallel. The question about what home and business are using um, is also very important. If you know, if the devices themselves aren't actually trying to use IPv6, then you're not. It doesn't matter if all the internet services are being 
um, published with V6, um, obviously you, you, you're still going to either be highly reliant on your NAT64 uh, NAT um, or, you know, we have devices which are insisting on V4 only, um, you're just not going to have your, you're just not going to have your, uh, um, the V6 traffic you're looking for. So for me, and I've thought this for a few years now, um, the time that we can start saying that we're winning on IPv6 translation is when we see that internet services um, can actually be published using IPv6 only. Now, it's taken us 12 years, um, 12 years to get to the point of, um, you know, just get, starting to get into um, stage two here, at least, uh, at least from Telstra's perspective, and uh, clearly from what I've heard uh, for a lot of providers around the world. When it comes to the public internet services, uh, services, you can do your, uh, you can do your queries now, even on some major. Um, uh, have a look at some major mail servers uh, and some major things. You'll find some are, have V6, some don't. Um, and I'm not saying that Telstra's uh, perfect on this either. There's certainly things that we need to do as well um, to tidy up uh, the space and make sure we're providing a consistent IPv6. Um, presentation. But the time when we uh, do have all public internet services support IPv6 um, you know, marks, really marks the point where IPv6 is the industry uh, business as usual. And then when home and business equipment supports IPv6, that marks when it's consumer bus uh, uh, business as usual. Um, and then when we get to internet services being published with V6 only, that's the time when you hope that IPv4 addresses no, uh, are no longer needed for services and you can start saying that public IPv4 addressing becomes legacy. But going da uh, back down to that second level, the, uh, where customers are connecting single stack with IPv6 only to NAT64, I fear that's a danger point. I fear that's the, uh, the time when you, uh, uh, the industry might say, oh, well, we've, we've stopped having to use IPv4 addresses for access. We've probably got enough IPv4 addresses now to keep us going for, uh, uh, for um, uh, publishing co uh, services, you know, for every, uh, um, all the hosting providers. We can d uh, do things to actually keep, uh, um, uh, keep dual stack on any services going for a long time now. Isn't that all we need to do? Isn't that enough? Well, you know, you look at where you could get to, and if you really want the internet to be, uh, get back to the simple stage it was, um, you can't, we can't afford to stop there. We really want to keep moving along and uh, get to a point where we don't have to com uh, commit the industry eternally to NAT444 um, or NAT64 um, along the way. We can get rid of the translation devices. Again, it's taken us 12 years just to get to that second level. I'm not under any uh, illusions that um, we'll get the other, uh, other four levels of the stack done in the next, uh, uh, next two years or, uh, or next month or anything. Um, I suspect it's going to be another 12 years. I hope by the time it <laughs> Um, it gets to 2045, uh, to David Conrad's uh, vision, that we may have ma actually made a, a, a good dent in this and that we're actually getting uh, somewhere at last. That's all I want to say for today. Um, oops. Other than thank you, I don't know what happened to the thank you. Um, are there any questions? Do, out of curiosity, any disagreements with anything I said? No? Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I look forward to uh, all your efforts to um, move, this, move this internet back to a world of simplicity and nat freedom. Thank you.
Okay, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jack Wang. Uh, he's going to introduce IPv6 uh, deployment and going to introduce uh, use. User Experience Monitoring, uh, Jack Wang from Zhonghua Telecom. Let's welcome. So, hello everyone. My name is Jake. Um, I come from Zhonghua Telecom Taiwan Highnet. And I'd like to share some V6 deployment experience. And, uh, why we have to do the monitor for the user experience in IPv6? Here's our agenda. First one is the V6 status in Taiwan, and the second will be the um, V6 deployment in CCT. We got fixed net and mobile, and also have the uh, V6 ready logo in telecommunication lab. And the third one will be the customer complaint for that. And what we are hearing from users. And in this case, we'd like to do the monitoring for the user experience in V6. Okay. Here's the rank, global ranking, uh, V6 global rankings of Taiwan. Right now, we got 40%. And uh, at the beginning, it's very low, right? And after that, we have the mobile network turn on the V6, and then it's a fixed net, so-called high net, and then we just launched V6 service in our Wi-Fi. So, as you can see right here, commercial network uh, IPv6, IPv6 deployment right here. The top four is all for the mobile network in Taiwan, and the number one is our mobile company is Imomi, get 83% uh, V6 capability rate. Uh, all right. And for this, it's our evaluation in CHT. We do lots of work and cooperate with TWNIC, thanks for Kenny. And uh, first one is our customer support. Actually, it's all for the SOP in our company. Usually customer service, they don't know how to solve the um, V6 problem, actually. So we have to training and tell them what they have to ask for the customers and collect the data for them. And the LI, we need to get a proof from the government. And for the information system, we got OSS, BSS verification. It's about the AAA profile. Uh, and for the network, we do lots of things about the security, do the filterings uh, for the uh, awareness, uh, malware, some kind of those. And the most difficult is for the CPE. We have to let our customer know what kind of CPE, which type of CPE is workable. They don't know uh, why they cannot use V6 at the beginning. So we have to train, we have to tell them how to seamless hand over for that. So uh, we start this, we have a trial run at 2017 for the fixed net and the Imomi 4G uh, LTE and do the Wi-Fi trial at the same time. And at the last year, 2019, we got lots of commercial IPv6 service and also, at the, also for the Wi-Fi. And for this one is our IPv6 readiness. That is to say, if the network got 100% IPv6 enabled, it's not enough for the users. Uh, users have to ex get the access, uh, get V6 con uh, V6 connection end to end from the UE to the CP uh, content providers. So right now we can find with only 25% uh, V6 capability for this kind. And for this curve right here, uh, drop down for this kind. We find some interesting issues. When we have a cable, sub-sea sub cable fault, 
the V6 uh, capability were dropping down. So when that recovered, uh, the usage can be recovery. And same as in the mobile network, but a little different is mobile networks should be have a, uh, should be coordinate with the manufacturers. And this one is our V6 Ready logo. Uh, telecommunication lab in our company is the only V6 Ready logo accredited lab in Taiwan. And uh, we are now have 1,800 products worldwide get V6 Ready logo. And in Taiwan, it's accounted for 17%. So, we do lots of work for this, but how about user experience? They, they even don't know what kind of connection they are use. They're using V6 or V4, they don't care. They just want to know how do they access the website or the content. So, the first problem is the latency issue. When they use, uh, V4 connection to access, they can get content or web, website object easily local. And when they turn use the V6 connection to get that, we found the latency is higher. And the reason is they have to get the object from uh, outside of our country. And the second problem is CPE MTU. Uh, for the CPE MTU default value is 1,500. And if the target web server environment doesn't support past MTU discovery, the response time of object will be increased. That means it's a popular uh, website in Taiwan. We simulate this kind of uh, situation for this. Uh, for the MTU of a CPE is, in, uh, is consistent with the web server. The response time is three, three seconds. But if it is inconsistent with the web server, the response time will get doubled. So that's why we have to use uh, this kind of two concepts. One is SDN. The second is NFV. SDN is a concept of uh, separating control and data plane in network. And we, we do have a controller and have a programmer to doing this. And for NFV, it's a virtualized function on commodity hardware. That brings us to, sh to have a shared simulator of this. And by combining these two concepts, we have a QoE platform that reduces our cap capex uh, compared with the traditional test bed, maybe. And we got two benefits. Number one is we have a shared equipment for the simulator. And the second is the dynamical access circuit provisioning. That is a very uh, interesting concept for this. Uh, let me check for this. Yes. We got four uh, QoE tests. We call it user experience QoE, right? Number one is broadband QoE and uh, CDN QoE, DNS QoE, Wi-Fi QoE. For the broadband QoE, we, can, uh, we have lots of pop in Taiwan. And once uh, we have to test in Taipei, we can provision an access circuit from Taipei to Taichung directly and have the PPE, social, uh, PPE station uh, direct dial up from Taichung broadband race. And the, in this way, we can have a uh, user's operating system and do dial up and have a tool such as a browser and get the data for the uh, popular websites. And here is some statistics data. As you can see, uh, in brief, it's almost no difference 
for the dual stake and IPv4. It's in the center of this point is zero. So we can use this test bed for 100, top 100 website from maybe Alexa or what else. Uh, in this way, we can easily to simulate and reproduce the customer issue than before. And to know the real user experience from the customer side, because we, we do its simulation directly, and to have uh, statistical data for both v4 and v6 connections. So uh, the most important thing is the capacity is reduced. So it's our uh, work for the v6 uh, experience monitoring. Thank you. Okay. If no more questions, let's thank Jack Wang. That's a smoky for appreciation. Thank you. So next speaker will be uh, Jing Heng Gu from Tiramika. He's going to introduce CPE development and also our interoperability testing. Thank you. And thanks, Kenny. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I will introduce the IPv6 the CPE development and the interoperability testing in Taiwan. Uh, this is Jing Hen from TWNIC. Uh, the purpose of how we do is to organize the CPE's IPv6 interoperability testing items uh, to assist the CPE manufacturer in developing and uh, testing IPv6 CPE. We established the actual IP, ISP test plans to verify the IPv6 uh, support capability of CPE uh, sold in Taiwan and uh, the using status uh, during the connection. Uh, we observed some uh, problems and the challenges to promote the popularization of IPv6 deployments in Taiwan. Uh, why is the, the use of CPE for broadband networking to support IPv6 is not widespread? It affects IPv6 end to end communication deployment. And uh, the fixed network uh, CPE equipment uh, supports varying uh, degree of IPv6. And uh, the process of replacing old network, network uh, CPE equipment uh, with uh, new ones is complicated and the uh, time time consuming. Uh, besides the CDN content and the cloud uh, platform support IPv6 development uh, slowly, uh, website and applications have a uh, lower percentage of IPv6. Uh, besides the uh, IPv6 security risk begin to immerse. And this presentation is focused on the uh, CPE the problem. Uh, we have some recommended necessary uh, test items uh, for fixed broadband uh, CPE. The uh, first one is the uh, we uh, test the IPv6 network access function of CPE uh, by PVPoE and the IPoE. Uh, because in Taiwan, the uh, Zhongha Telecom Fiber Optical Internet, they using the PVPoE configuration uh, process. But the uh, cable broadband internet, they using uh, IPoE configuration process. So we need to test the PPPoE and the IPoE uh, environment. And uh, the PPPoE uh, redirect behavior, the need to test the automatic redirect uh, function after PPPoE disconnection. And after the WAN port is disconnected, the CPE uh, can reconnect. And uh, when verifying the the CPE will notify the LAN user through the RA me uh, mechanism. The uh, third uh, test item is the MTU test. Uh, we need to test the MTU size, the setting function of CPE. And the RA sent by the LAN size of CPE contain the reduced MTU in the about uh, 1,492. 
The fourth test item is uh, about the uh, address configuration uh, test of the host on the LAN size. Uh, we test the CPE LAN network has the IPv6 address auto configuration functions. Uh, check if the CPE support SLA, C, DHCP v6 and the RDNSS configuration mode. The fifth uh, necessary test item is the IPv6 uh, firewall function. Uh, we test the basic function of IPv6 firewall of the CPE. The, the, they need to filter ICM ability to filter ICMP v6 packet and, uh, the, and the formulate the filtering rule for packets. Uh, besides the necessary test items, we have some suggestions on the uh, selective uh, test items. Uh, it is recommended that the selected test item based on the IPv6 ready load uh, interconnectivity uh, standard uh, test items. Uh, blue uh, test uh, is recommended for a priority test uh, after the, uh, we uh, interview with the vendors, we have some uh, conclusion uh, in the Blue text. So besides uh, test items, we built up the IPv6 the test platform. The, the red uh, line is the PPPoE uh, connection. It's based on the uh, fiber internet uh, from the high net. The blue uh, line is the IPoE connection. It's uh, uh, from the cable operators that connect to the CMTS uh, by the uh, cable modem router. Uh, we uh, have chosen some uh, popular uh, IPv6 CPE. Uh, so in Taiwan, uh, we have uh, 10 uh, models, and uh, they belong to four brands, D-Link, ASUS, TP-Link, and TotalLink. It's, uh, it's more uh, popular uh, in Taiwan. So we uh, have the 14 uh, test items uh, of IPv6 CPE uh, using the PPPoE. Uh, for example, we uh, uh, either CPE, uh, PPoE dial up normal, and, uh, or the, when the CPE is redirect, uh, is the user uh, IPv6 update normal? Or the, is it normal for user to use IPv6 MTU? Or whether the IPv6 PPPoE it automatically uh, enabled as the IPv4 PPPoE is enabled? And the, the, is the IPv6 SCL functions properly? So we uh, test using these test items uh, one by one to uh, in that our platform to, uh, to test the CPE. Uh, these uh, 14 items is using uh, in uh, uh, by PPPoE. Oh. Mm. Uh, these uh, 13 uh, test items is connected to the cable modem. The cable, uh, cable operators, well, we also have test uh, is the CPE connect to the cable modem normal and uh, when the CPE retire the cable modem, uh, is the user uh, IPv6 update normal? Or uh, whether the IPv6 connectivity is automatically uh, enabled as the IPv4 uh, is enabled? And, uh, and uh, finally, it is the IPv6 uh, SEL uh, functions is properly. So we also uh, using these 14 uh, Test items to st uh, one by one uh, in our, our CP in this, uh, this CPEs, and there are uh, three uh, IPv6 CP address configuration. The the one is the SLAC plus the DHCP v6 the status. The second is state for the third is uh, SLAC plus the RDNSS. We find out there are eight. Uh, type uh, of models uh, support these three uh, kinds of the uh, configuration. Uh, uh, two types uh, does not support uh, SLAC plus RDNSS. And uh, uh, there are one type only support RADVD plus SLAC, 
and the one model support the IADVD plus DHCP v6. And uh, uh, we observe and uh, find out some, uh, uh, the when the vendors are more willing to launch IPv6 for new uh, listing and the uh, higher price the product models, uh, mainly due to the resource cost consideration and uh, let vendors invest in development and the testing. So some CPE has the, have IPv6 enabled uh, by default, but some unsupported model. Uh, they just can be updated by firmware. So it is recommended that like CPE vendors can actively provide the list of the uh, currently available products that to support IPv6 device model. So the, to, the customer can be a reference uh, for portraying IPv6 uh, CPE. The second observation is that although the many new list or higher high-end uh, CPE already support IPv6, uh, there is still a lack of consistent standards for the IPv6 functional configuration, uh, such as IPv6 MTU and the address configuration mode. So we uh, we recommend that the manufacturer set the factory def default MTU for products to 1,492. Uh, this is recommended to implement consistent standard de development, uh, SLAC, studies, DHCP, V6, uh, SLAC, uh, RDN, SS more, uh, as uh, be used by, by default. So the third uh, observation is the uh, CPE uh, mainly configure the IPv6 address on the LAN side through the PD method. So if the uh, cable modem is installed in router mode, the LAN side of the user uh, supply CPE cannot be configured with uh, IPv6 address. So uh, it is recommend that the cable modem uh, be installed in bridge mode by default, so they, they can, uh, the CPE can be uh, successful, be uh, uh, used. So then that's, the, that's all my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you much. Any uh, questions? Okay. I, Jordi Palet. Uh, I understand that uh, all what you mentioned is assuming dual stack, yeah. right? I will suggest that uh, for the next batch of testing, mm. or when you speak with, with vendors, you ask them to support uh, IPv6 only. Oh, okay. Because yeah. Keep, yeah. Keep going, trying to keep going with dual stack always means using CGNAT for the IPv4 part, so that makes sense. So um, probably you need to tell them uh, to, to take in consideration RFC 8585. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, because uh, our environment is uh, dual stack, I know, but uh, we, when we make the test, uh, we, uh, we are uh, disabled IPv4. So this also connect by IPv6. Maybe your uh, suggestion we will to yeah, do it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, any question? Okay. Are you going to raise a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, just a small confusion of clarification. Hi, Tashi from Apinika, Jody. Uh, yeah. Even if both are running good on happy eyeballs, ensure that the whatever content is available on V6 would anyway move over to V6, so I wouldn't really have to scale whatever CGNet box I have. Right? Only, so what I'm trying to say is, even if it's dual stack, yes, and if Happy Eyeballs is working as it's supposed to work, my sessions should anyway shift over to V6, meaning loads. It's a CGNAT offload, right? Traffic from my CGNAT would anyway get offloaded, right? So what I'm trying to say is, they wouldn't necessarily have to scale the CGNAT. The box is there already. 
Yeah, but the point, the point is making sure that the CPE at some point support IPv6 only. Because a CPE with dual stack not necessarily will work correctly in a situation where the ISP is delivering only IPv6. And it needs to choose which transition mechanism, if MAP-T or MAP-E or forces for x or whatever. So the ideal is, that's the reason I work at in RFC 8585 to resolve that problem. Okay, so, and there is another problem now that you mentioned happy ables and, and probably it, it has to some relation with the presentation from the guy from, from Telstra as well, is that it's true that happy ables solve some of the problems, but happy ables don't resolve the problems of filtering MTU, I mean path MTU discovery. So happy ables is not, is not perfect. And one recommendation that I always do is when you do any IPv6 deployment, and also Jeff somehow mentioned that in his presentation, you really need to make sure that you are monitoring your IPv6 network because sometimes you are in dual stack and you don't realize that your IPv6 connectivity or routing is broken because customers don't complain because today we have mainly dual stack and it's falling back because happy evolves. So this is key in any deployment. Make sure to monitor your network with IPv6 as well as you do with IPv4. That's it. Okay, okay. okay. any question? Okay, if no more questions, let's mock it for appreciation. Okay, we finish all the presentation and you can experience we have different struggle situation. Some people prefer IPv6 only, some people struggle with the dual stake and somehow the dual stake mi misleading our monitoring situation and make our management more complicated. However, according to current status, we still have a similar situation in a very short future. Hopefully we can transition to a IPv6 only, the ultimate destination in a very short time. And thank you again for your participation. Thank you uh, again. I conclude the session is finished. Thank you. <laughs>